Welcome to the Interlocutor Interviews podcast. I'm Tyler Nessler, the founder of Interlocutor Magazine. Today I've got with me Alex E. Chavez, who recently released his debut solo LP, Sonorous Present, and you just heard the opening to one of its songs, Catalina. Before we begin, just a few notes. We aim to provide diverse, independent, and in-depth coverage of arts, culture, and activism. So if you appreciate what we do, please help support us with a low monthly subscription. Click the subscribe button on our site's page for this episode. Plus, you can keep up to date on our latest features by signing up for our email newsletter. And please also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and here's my interview with Alex E. Chavez. All right, hello, Alex. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing doing well. Thanks for, for having me, uh, Tyler. I appreciate it. Well, I just wanted to start off by getting a little bit into your background. You're a cultural anthropologist trained in linguistic anthropology, ethnomusicology, and folklore, and you're the author of the book Sounds of Crossing. So could you talk a bit about the book and what it explored and, and also how it all ties into your, your research background? Yeah, so that book, which was published by Duke University Press in 2017, largely focused on sort of the relationship between music and migration, but specifically music and Mexican migration. And I, I explored this particular folk music uh, from north central Mexico called Wapangua Ribeño, which is part of a kind of a deeper tradition of, of, of Mexican music. I mean, Mexican music has a really broad, broad kind of and rich landscape, different sounds and traditions. And this is one of them that makes up the, the broader tradition of what people in, in, in Mexico and, and, you know, Mexican music call son, spelled S O N. And largely son music in, in Mexico is string music. Right, and so I think a lot of people know one variant. Most, I mean, if most people do, it, and that's like mariachi, which is very stylized because it comes from Western Mexico and it's got trumpets and all these other things. But, right. but that's that's a stylized version of string music, and there are a lot of variants. And one is Wapango Ribeño, which which comes from North Central Mexico and has a a really kind of rich, kind of you know, aesthetic tradition of of improvised poetry. And kind of verbal and and poetic dueling that's part of the the performance. And so, long story short, you know that that music, in many ways, is part of my kind of assumed musical heritage because my my family's from that region on, on my father's side. And so I had a memory of this, you know, this music. And you know, when I was living in Austin, Texas, years ago, I I I came across musicians who were playing this music, and I, I really messed with my kind of taking for granted kind of cultural atlas of like where this music existed. And so I was already playing music. I've been playing music my whole life. I was already playing some traditional stuff. And so I I just befriended these musicians and, and initially was just learning and playing with them. And that turned into research. And largely to circle back, this relationship between, you know, them as migrants, as Mexican migrants, many of them undocumented, and how is it that through this music they lent meaning to their own migration? You know, and I, right. I which, which is a it's a it's not an insignificant thing, particularly I mean, especially even right now when we consider the, the topic of immigration being top of mind yeah, in our politics, sure. right? So, so that's what that book studied. You know that music in Mexico, in the U.S., among migrants, and and the kind of politics of of music, the politics of of migration, and the relationship between the two. And as I mentioned, that those traditions are part of my music that I've known and and have played and 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 really connected with that have informed a good deal of of the things I've been interested in and and kind of scholarly circles, but, but also musically, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, now you have your first solo album out, Sonorous Present. And it's got poetry from the acclaimed Roger Reeves, also interwoven with field recordings and guest appearances from stars from song and jazz and the R&B worlds. And it's been several years in the making. And what I find really interesting is it began as an improvised performance in 2019, which was inspired by your book. So 
Could you talk a bit about this particular improvised performance? Like, where was it? Who did you play it with and, and for? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So I, in in the course of, you know, kind of extending the life of that book, I, I really I had the opportunity to present that material in different settings, mainly scholarly, you know, like giving lectures about it. And because right. <clears throat> the book had won a number of awards. And so I, I was speaking in the States. I got to go to Europe a few times. But beyond the kind of, I guess, kind of customary kind of lecture situation, uh, one of the things that I would do sometimes was incorporate actually the kind of more typical like lecture e type things, but also I would perform music hmm. in some ways connected to the book and also incorporate some deeper storytelling or, or, or reading to give context of of contents of the book. In any case, I got sort of inspired by that and and was like, well, what if I? It'd be, it'd be, it'd be interesting to do this as a full ensemble, and what what would that look like? And right. so I reached out actually to a number of people who ended up being on the record, including Roger Reeves, for instance, including Laura Cambron, who sings on the record, Matt Ulery, who did the string arrangements, and a host of other people. And we, we sort of put some things together and, and we, we had this kind of debut performance at uh, this, this, this space called The Hungry Brain in Chicago, here in Chicago. And, and yeah, I mean, it, it was exploring some of these musical motifs but you know a lot of improvisation a lot of what roger was doing was kind of you know improvising poetry and it, it was a really wonderful thing and i then was inspired to like well it'd be cool to to grow this as a project potentially yeah not really knowing where it would go and then covid happens so you know we, you can't perform live yeah. that's, that's not possible so so then the next logical step was to pivot and to try to make a record, I guess. But I knew that I didn't want to just somehow document what we had kind of done live because ideally what you, at least what I would have wanted to do was, well, continue to explore and grow live and then see what comes of that and then step into to a studio to to record. But in lieu of that, my first thought was like, well, work with a producer because that that not having the opportunity to grow something live bringing someone in to reimagine or, or or just help grow things would 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 kind of be you know the next kind of uh, step to do particularly in you know covid and, and everything else so that's that's the connection between those those moments and why it ended up being you know a, a record and then, so this is how is it? Uh, Quetzal Flores got mm-hmm. involved. Yeah, the, yeah, the producer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Quetzal, who's you know, it's really important, sort of foundational East LA musician, founder of the band Quetzal, which is his namesake, and you know, Grammy Award winner. And I've I've known him for a long time, and uh, he uh, behind because he also comes from this world of traditional music, traditional Mexican music, mm. but he's also someone like me that is always pushing at or pulling at, depending on your perspective, but the kind of horizons of tradition. Like, it's like, yeah, we've been steeped in this, but we can reimagine, I guess, and, and we're not really afraid to do that. And so, yeah, he, he he's the first person, the first and only person <laughs> that I reached out to, and thankfully he said, yeah. Yeah, no, sounds like it worked out beautifully. In your opinion, like, how did he help to really kind of shape the album? What did he bring to the table that really kind of solidified the, I don't know, the overall direction and scope of the album? Oh, that's 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 great to, to kind of talk about. I mean, there are a lot of things. I mean, I can give you two very maybe specific examples, but but I think overall, it, it was maybe part of what what i mentioned before this 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 willingness to kind of you know understand the, the this crucible right of like tradition and what that is you know with respect to you know mexican music and what we know and how a lot of what we you know 
understand as being part of these communities of practice that sort of forged us as as musicians and 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 also even as as, as thinkers or people who approach kind of politics of all these things is that we hold on to that and cherish that while at the same time we understand that ultimately for instance for him he he would say he's like well yeah he's like but i'm chicano you know it's like i'm from east la i'm not from southern mexico right so the things i'm going to do are always going to be inherently influenced by a number of other things that that maybe you know kind of are in the throes of like another kind of experience of growing up like for me like in the states right two immigrant parents and and such and so you know he's you know like me he's like yeah well you know we we love you know r&b just as much as we love wapango we we appreciate and are inspired by like you know post-punk you know to like you know, Song Jarocho, you know, Afro-Mexican Song Jarocho from Veracruz and all those things sort of are, are just part of our vocabulary. And right. and so that as a context, I think, was something that I knew with him we could do. And, and it's not unfamiliar to me. I've done this in other projects, just, just being always willing to explore. But this thing was so specific, given the songwriting and the kind of sonic palette I I, I wanted to at least explore, not knowing we would end up here necessarily a bit but that was a starting point and and he was all in and and encouraging and someone who would never scoff at like oh well okay well here's here's a traditional instrument well let's use that and i don't know like just a roland juno you know with it like oh yeah those things go perfectly together i wouldn't they right another context something might be like what are you doing Uh, but we sort of you know or like bringing in roger reeves to do spoken word Right. been you know some odd meter wapango thing like i i don't know like we 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 he was just imaginative in that way and, and I'll, I'll give you two very specific examples as to like how that sort of manifested itself one is so there are no drums on the record so so there are, so the percussive elements that you hear are either like hand percussion so like cuban bata drumming so kind of african west african kind of derived a lot of cajon but then also a lot of the stuff that sounds i think a little more abrasive in the sense that it kind of harkens toward being drums are actually footsteps patterned footsteps that sort of that are stomping on on what is called the tarima which is a wooden stomp box oh wow and so like which is part of some of these dance traditions in mexico and so we took his partner marta gonzalez we basically sampled her stomping on the tarima and looped it and or created patterns with it. It's like, oh, th- this is the rhythmic foundation, right? Yeah. So like things like that, right? Like, oh, okay, like that is far more of an interesting way of referencing tradition, you know, I, I think. And another example is also, you mentioned before, like field recordings. That was something that was really inspiring, you know, in, in, the, in the run-up to me going out to L.A. to, when we first started working, he asked me if I had, if I had field recordings and I was like, well, yeah, of course I've, you know, did research for a decade. I have yeah. like I have too much, <laughs> all this archive of stuff. And he was like, well, why don't you pick some out or curate some that are meaningful to you or that you just like or whatever. It, it can be anything really and bring them and let's see what we can do with them. And so I did, I brought out a number of things and what we ended up doing was using a number of those sounds, whether they be people's voices or or some music, or or even there's a couple of field recordings. There's one of, of me walking, for instance. We used all of that sonic material and incorporated it into the actual compositional process. This is to say that, okay, this is part of the song. So let's loop it and create a rhythm or let's sample it and see if we can create a bed of, of kind of, kind of, of sound with it right. that then we can use to be part of the composition. And what that does, I would have never thought of this, but what that does in terms of this notion of like ethnographic songwriting, it, it brings the listener into that world instead of explicitly, let's say, referencing it poetically. So, 
Right. If, if you hear me walking in the town of Rio Verde, San Luis Potosí, the center is already there, as opposed to me have somehow writing a song that references that place. It's like, okay, we're yeah. already in the place, and I'm just going to say what, you know, what occurs to me and, you know, with respect to what, you know, whatever it is that, whatever message I'm trying to convey emotively. But right. so those are specific examples that I thought were to your question that he, he was really helpful with all that and, and had a hand in, in kind of in, in shaping what the record became. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the field recordings lend a real atmosphere and naturalism to it. And, you know, as you were saying, it, that does bring the listener directly into it. It's kind of like, you know, like in writing, they say, you know, show, don't tell. And you're kind of like in this case here, you know, instead of like how, how you said, you know, singing about it or trying to lyrically express, you know, the atmospheres of these places, you literally are bringing it to the listener, showing it to them. So that was a great aspect to it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, that that's precisely I like how you, how you put it. Yeah, and so it also must have been fun for you to go through your archive. Did you rediscover any recordings that you had kind of forgotten about, or that were just like nice surprises that you know kind of brought you back to a specific time when you were doing the recording that you had sort of you know had just forgotten about over the years? Yeah, totally. I there there was, for instance, there's this moment. I mean, short answer, yeah. There, there are a few things that, like, I, I sort of heard and, and that, I, yeah, that I rediscovered, and that were, were kind of moving, because they just brought back memories. And in, in other cases, I, I sort of remembered, like, oh, I, I recall a certain situation where, you know, there was something about it that, that. But maybe I just didn't write it down or document it well enough in notes or whatever. So I, I would I just went back and listened. I was like, oh yeah, this is what that was. So there's one example is there's this song called "Dando los Días." It literally means giving giving the day. But, but what it's a reference to is in at dawn and in some poetic traditions that are ethnic Mexican people people use the the decimo, which is a tin line stanza in, in the morning to sort of like welcome, welcome the day as a kind of ritual of, of kind of like waking up. Right. So, so that, that's the name of the song. And that's, that's some kind of, but actually this loop of a performance uh, that I documented in the mountains of, of Guanajuato in this, this small town called Hichu every new year that community brings in the new year with, with a performance of this music, this Wapango music that I, that I explored in the book sounds of crossing. And so as soon as, it, and it happens in public in the central plaza, you know, there's thousands of people there dancing. And what happens as soon as the church bells ring midnight, that it's the new year, these performers start and they go until noon the next day. So the entire night wow. they're, they're performing, improvised poetry and music. And I remember a moment, and I, I did that for over a decade. Every New Year, it was there, like you know, researching, working, etc. But and there are many memorable moments of, of, of throughout all those years. But one in particular, I just recall the ensemble, you know, just right in the heat of performance at like you know five a.m. or something, and something really special happened sonically, at least for me, in what the violinists were playing. This this kind of melodic figure they were they were sort of you know they were playing they were you know as as like sometimes we say with bands right they were cooking they were yeah. they were they were locked in you know yeah and it was beautiful and I found that moment again and I remember showing it uh, showed it to said, listen to this isn't this this like you know there's something wistful and kind of a sense of elation you know when you hear this he's like that's amazing he's like let's Let's kind of let's let's and it's total kind of hip hop production. We were like, okay, let let's grab this little piece, let's let's loop it, set a BPM. We might need to tune it a little bit, and let's just let it go. We did, and then then it was like, okay, well, let's write. Wow, <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so that was just playing and we were just like, okay, yeah. well, so like, that's a great example of something I, I kind of rediscovered and it, and it, it like in that moment, just by myself, you know, as I was kind of rediscovering, sure. gave me goosebumps. And then when I brought it to Quetzal and it became this other thing, it was like made my hair stand up, you know, it's like, oh, this, is, yeah. Yeah, this is lovely. This is like kind of, kind of amazing. I, I would have never thought to do something like that. Yeah. So which song did that wind up on? I can't remember if you said. Yeah, that song, Dando Los Dias. Okay. Yeah, I believe it's like uh, the uh, third or fourth. <laughs> I forget. <laughs> <laughs> I should know the track listing. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, that's a uh, example of, of something like that. Yeah, no, I mean, that that's really special. Uh, you, you had captured this kind of ephemeral moment, you know, um, with these musicians when they were, as you said, cooking, you know. <laughs> And, and, and this very kind of like lovely sounding, you know, New Year's, New Year's uh, tradition. So, yeah, that must have been fantastic to rediscover that, that and then incorporate it into the album like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the other thing that I really was curious about, you know, since you cross collaborated with Reeves, you know, with the, with the writer on this, how did, how did, well, first of all, I, I believe he, composed the poetry to the music right he didn't come in with the poetry already written out is that correct he he had like part? yeah because there were some things he sort of kind of sketched out it seems a, a little bit but he i had asked him you know of course you know th think about what you might you know well, let me back up. So he he had heard some of the songs because we had some of the mixes. And so not all of it, but some of it. And I was like, well, listen to this. Also, thematically, this is what I'm writing about. I was like, and so just stick with it. But like, don't necessarily, you know, have pinned everything before you get here. It's like when you get here, you know, things are going to be changing and shifting. I, I want you to maybe write and, and kind of be inspired in the moment and so he 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 did that why well, he might have for a couple of things have had a sketch or two he largely wrote in the studio and, and those sketches were kind of you know finalized as it were in 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 the space of, of the studio and did did his compositions in any way kind of reverse influence the music like in the sense of when he came up with certain phrasings, did do you try to kind of, you know, did it did it? Well, I want to get in as it did. Did it influence the comp, the you know the arrangements at all? Yeah, definitely. Um, where you know we, we already had the kind of general form, right. and then where, when he came in, you know, it really was dependent on, you know, in some ways, and it's very kind of practical like what's the length of what he's doing or where might there be a, an ability to pause what he's doing that could create space for something else so yeah definitely that that then ended up shaping how then things were arranged in the end um like one really kind of interesting example is there's this a song called uh, dirty hands and there is this an entire kind of, you know, I don't know, like in section that features Roger, you know, this, this very kind of extended piece of his, which is quite beautiful. And, but we'll, but it, it's, it, it is in conversation with a, uh, uh, two other musicians, Nick Mazzarella and Chad McCullough, who are improvising trumpet, trumpet and, and, and sax. And they, and so, for instance, there, like Nick Mazzarella had arranged like a, a figure that was going to begin kind of the piece or, or the moment, that moment of that end section. And then it just sort of spirals out into this kind of improvised filigree and Roger's like tucked in there. Right. And then there's a yeah. moment where he pauses and, and those two just, you know, kind of go off in the space. Right. Before he then brings us back. And they start to scale back, and then the kind of music just it it, it, go, it kind of strips down to its kind of to its core. 
So that's a really good example of like what he was saying and the kind of the the recitation and the cadence sort of help arrange the arc of of that. For instance, totally, yeah. That that yeah. that was a kind of a fun experience, and and it was to us as Roger and and but of course Getzal, everybody being open to that, just like okay, look, there's an idea here, but let's just kind of yeah. let's just see right and then we'll it, we'll, we'll figure it out it'll be all right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well i mean it's great it sounds like extremely collaborative and then there was a lot of trust between all of you too you know yeah and yeah openness. Definitely. And there was and i i i sort of i was very grateful for that you know be, because you know these were all my compositions and and musically and lyrically and you know that that people appreciated you know what what I brought to the table and, and wanted to be a part of it was was amazing i I couldn't have asked for 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 more yeah. and then also that you know I was also very much like look this is these are you know these are forms and sketches, but like i I want everybody to sort of distill it through their own kind of creativity, you know so letting people kind of do what, what they do. Cause that's in some reason, like, or, or the reason why I, I, I wanted them on the record, you know? So I was like, yeah, I, I, I love what you do. I love what, you know, I love your music. I love your playing. So I, I want you to do that here with me. So to have that freedom to do that, I, th- I thought took a lot of trust in, you know, that, 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 you know, in terms of like that they, we're trusting in me in terms of like what I brought to the table, but then clearly it's, it's the other way as well that I of course trusted everybody just to, 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 to bring their kind of their, their creativity and their heart to it. And, and, yeah. uh, and I think that they, they, they definitely. Yeah, for sure. Well, obviously a lot of very talented and accomplished people are playing on this album. There's several. Martha Gonzalez, Aldo Black. Yeah, Aldo, uh, yeah, yeah. Ramon yeah. Gutierrez. Yeah, yeah, and then definitely. Lucia Gutierrez, Robo, Roboyoso. Yeah, mm-hmm. Lucia Gutierrez. Uh, and then you you actually sang with her, correct? Like, would you... Yeah, yeah, there's this last, this actually this this latest single, or, or the latest, the, the last single off the record, Catalina. Yeah, she she's singing on on that specific uh, song. Did all these wonderful harmonies. Yeah, she's an amazing yeah. jazz vocalist from Mexico. She sometimes tours with um, the famous Mexican artist Natalia La Forcada. Uh, yeah, she's amazing. And you mentioned Ramon Gutierrez, who's actually her father. Yeah, he is one of the founding members of this legendary group from. Veracruz, Mexico, called Son de Madera. They play the Afro Mexican Son Jarocho, and they're world renowned. They're they're amazing. I've known him for for a long time as well. We had never done anything together, but 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 I I I love his his work, and and I brought him in to sing on something specific that's very much in in the vein of Son Jarocho, and and Marta Gonzalez, of course, you know Gonzalez's partner. She sang on a few things, and of course, did the the pattern footwork. And I've known her as long as I'm a kid, and they're just amazing. I, I they're they're like family to me. And then, of course, Roger, who we've been mentioning, and Matt Eulery, and everybody. And Aloe Black was an interesting one. That I, he and Quetzal are close, and and known each other for a long time. And and there was one song that well, that Dirty Hand song in particular. It was written and all the rest and and you know, I mean I was going to sing it but but there are a lot of tracks on there that I I was sort of like yeah sure I can sing these but I think it would be far more interesting or like I just heard other people's voices on it you know so yeah and that was one I was like well who and gets like well we should get Aloe on it I was like well I mean <laughs> if he wants to do it yeah you know he's like a huge deal he's amazing and. But they know each other, and he was like, "Yeah, let me ask him." And he he did. And what was really interesting about it is that, you know, Alo is partly of Panamanian descent. I don't know how many people know that about him. And 
so he you know he grew up speaking spanish and all the rest but all his music is you know is in english it's r&b and to my knowledge and and you know gets out confirmed this you know, he's never recorded something in spanish oh, and wow. i was like I was like, that's amazing. That's even cooler. So yeah, he, he like he I mean that song, you know, he sang it and and it's kind of kind of a little bit I'm still kind of in disbelief that he like those are my lyrics that he like, you know <laughs> sang, you know. And it's super so yeah, I mean a lot of this stuff was super, you know, kind of natural and, and, and organic with respect to you know, just the people that were involved and and and, and that again that they were they were, you know, definitely willing to do it and, 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 and were, you know, did, did an amazing, you know, contributions. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, again, I think that all of that, that trust in the, you know, how familiar you are with a lot of them and how far back you go with a lot of them does lend kind of an additional sort of a warm tone to the, to the project, I would say, to the recording. And you know, you know, adding to the naturalism of it, at least to my ear. So yeah, it came together really beautifully. I want, I really wanted to talk about the music videos too, because I've seen a video for the song Catalina and Complices de Luto. Mm-hmm. And so they're animated in kind of this minimalist black and white, but you know, it looks like they were shot on old film stock. And you know, like they're old old movies or old silent movies, kind of in a way. Directed by a studio, Noema. Yeah, Is that correct. Uh-huh. Okay, so it's an art animation and video studio, and then also in collaboration with this visual artist and and poet, Celestial Brizuela. Yeah, Brizuela. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. How did that all come together? Like, first of all, what were some of the thematic ideas behind these videos in relation to the songs? How closely did you work with the studio and with Celestial and, and all of that? Yes. Yeah, so Estudio Neuma is the, the main person there is his name is Miguel Jara. And he's based out of Mexico City. And he collaborates often. And so he, he this is the work that he, through his studio, does. It's all animation. So if you kind of look at all the work that's out there, but by, by him, by his studio, Noma, it's, it's all, it's all animation and, and, and all different kinds, you know, and, but, but it largely has this sort of aesthetic, this kind of almost stop motion y kind of aesthetic, this very yeah. minimal. Sort of, there's an analog feel to it. Cool. Even they, they also work with like digitally and all the rest, but that's, that's kind of the, the the kind of their their style and I so I had I had worked with them previously with my my other my my Chicago based project Los Santos we had done one video with them for the the record that we put out City of Mirrors through International Anthem and that collaboration came about because some people that we know in common based here in Chicago and 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 so. And, I, and so over the years, I, I had kept in touch with Miguel, and 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 as soon as everything was coming together, I was like, okay, well, I I'd, I'd like to at least have two or three videos with these singles, and and I'm really <laughs> I'm very uninterested in <laughs> like being part of some like live action kind of video thing. I don't, I'm not, that's not yeah. do, you know, yeah. So <laughs> I was like. Well, I want videos, but I don't want to, you know, be in them or anything like that. I, uh, but, but I do, but, but in, in part because I just, I want to tell a story. Right. And, you know, it's already my music and it's already my voice. I don't, you know, I, I, that's the most important thing. And so I, 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 yeah, I, I thought of, of, of Miguel. So I, I reached out and like this record and, how much lead time would you need to do this? Cause it takes them a long time to, to make those videos um, right. uh, months. And so we talked about it and the scheduling worked and, and we had a few conversations around, you know, one, what were the songs you know, about? What were my initial kinds of thoughts around maybe an aesthetic direction? And then of course, in some ways also deferring to them about like what, 
what what did the music evoke in them too right like what, what like what does this make you think of and he's like oh so so a lot of the narrative that's being told visually there you know were ideas that that he's and, and celestial kind of brainstormed and then brought to me and we talked them through and then i was like okay go for it i was like I I love i'm gonna love i'm gonna love what you do i i i yeah. just you know so yeah they they brought back these two really touching uh you know visual representations of, of the songs that are i think really wistful they they deal with those themes i think that are in in the songs themselves around loss but also integrating them with this broader kind of conversation i'm having on the record about migration and crossing and and so it was it was very easy to work with them because you know having known them for a bit but also just because I, I mean i just trust their work they, it's really amazing and so i'm I'm really happy with, with that so i'm glad you yeah you get to check them out and, and that the you think that they kind of they they they're evocative of maybe what the, what is going on sonically you know uh, sometimes yeah no i really i really think that i think it was a good choice too to go with the the animation rather yeah. than live action with this yeah. Yeah, I how that just works better in in a in with giving it more of an analog and, and kind of lyrical and almost like folklore kind of feel to it visually. I think <laughs> that's that was my that was my take. No, no, yeah. no, no. That I appreciate you saying that because I I think there is some kind of a way of evoking a kind of a different sort of I guess use value with respect to the sonic and 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 but these visual representations that they bring similar to what we were talking about before about like the the field recording stuff like they they sort of they they bring you into this world i guess um, yeah, and i yeah. they 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 did a really lovely lovely work on on those two videos yeah well so do you have any plans to play any of this live or to tour i mean that might be a little tricky there's a lot of people involved and, <laughs> and you have to kind of Maybe get other different musicians if you're going to do any kind of extensive playing of this live. But where are you at with that right now? Yeah, Lines. so we yeah we did we premiered like a soft ish premiere of of this with with some of the musicians that are on it and others uh, that are not at the the Getty in Los Angeles this past spring. We did two shows, and in some ways for us and Getzal is kind of the band, the musical director. It was for us kind of like proof of concept, oh, right? Yeah. Can, we, can we do this live? And so, yeah, it's like a nine person ensemble and, and we brought in like live visuals and it was really lovely, really wonderful. And and then we, we did a kind of a, a shorter thing at Stanford University. And so for us, it, for me in particular, it was oh, proof of concept such that you know, now that the record's coming out, yeah, the, the hope is to definitely try and, and and play live, and most likely, it's it's just it's just a different proposition because you know, this is not like a band, you know, right. <laughs> it's like an it's an experience. It's a bit immersive. It's more right. of a, you know, it's it's storytelling, and so. It, you know the kinds of spaces that we would do this at. Definitely, you know, of course, performing art centers and things of that nature. And so, right now, yeah, we're trying to work on doing a few things, uh, particularly in, in the new year. You know, what's because you know the record is out this month, and then hopefully by you know the beginning of twenty five to try and do some things around the country and to to really bring it together again as as a kind of as as an experience that conveys the kind of the deeper stories here. Uh, yeah. And, and it was, it was really fun doing that at the Getty in, in the spring. And I, I really, I'd look forward to, 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 to doing it again in this, this coming year. Well, I would also imagine just playing live because it's already, you know, it's a improvised, there's an improvised nature to the album. That you have obviously room for even further improvisation, you know, when you're playing live with this and different interpretations, you know, almost like, you know, like, like, you know, jazz bands when they play, 
they can do reinterpretations of standards or their own work is a little bit different every time. You know? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. That, <laughs> well, that, no, that was definitely the kind of the approach was like, okay, well, you know, here's, you know, here's the idea, right. But like we can, there's room to breathe, you know, in terms of what we're, what we, you know, how, how we want to, to interpret and, and play. And, and that's, that's fun as well, especially with, particularly the people that, that were part of the the Getty performances and which I anticipate just being part of, of, of the ensemble going forward. They're all just super amazing people. I mean, Quetzal and Marta are part of it, but also we brought in Martin Perna from Antibalas, who's, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's you know, doing percussion and, and sax and, and Rocio Morron is amazing violinist. It's just, they're amazing people. So it's like when you're playing with people like that, it's like, oh yeah, there's room to breathe in the context of what we're doing live. And, and everybody's just a sort of, you know, just playing great and able to communicate and really kind of extend the life of the songs in the moment. And that's, that's kind yeah. of fun. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, musicians love that. Yeah. It's like a dream to be able to have that kind of room, you know, yep. to play around and, and improvise. Yep. Well, Alex, it was great talking with you. Oh, likewise. Likewise, Tyler. And, and I really appreciate you, 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 you know, for the invitation to, to chat about, about, about the record um, and for, for listening. <laughs> no, it's my pleasure. And so Sonorous Present is out on October 18th through Artivist Entertainment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So yeah, be on the lookout for that. And thanks again. Thank you.